world today continues to be one great mission field, even in countries that have a long history of Christian traditions. The late Holy Father, Pope John Paul II, once said, It is not enough for us to discover Christ. We must also bring him to others. Mother Regina Marie, I'm so glad you came to talk to us today and to be on our show and to take the time to be interviewed by us. It's really a pleasure to have you. I've heard so much about you. We've heard fantastic reports about your talks. What did you talk about today? The one that I gave today was actually a very difficult one for me. In the name of it was The Obedient Heart. Oh. And I wrestled with it a lot. And I actually came down to the convention with the top, uh, talk pretty much finished. But it didn't quite settle on my heart because I was being nice. It, it, it lacked the fire, um, the challenge. I almost, at the beginning of the conference, said to the people, if you're expecting me to make you feel real good, <laughs> like across the street at Disneyland, when we have the, um, uh, the Matterhorn, so some of those bigger roller coaster rides, they'll say, if, if you have back injuries or if you have neck injuries, exit now. <laughs> I, was gonna, I almost said that to the people, but I was, I was <laughs> this isn't going to be it, uh, a real comfortable talk. It's a hard talk. Um, so it was very intense. So I rewrote the whole thing last night and challenged. It was, it was a challenge. So obedience is a very difficult thing. Because the whole point of what I was getting at is it's not superficial obedience. Mm. That we can, in reality, have something going on in the surface of our heart that's good. You know, we can do a lot of good things. We can do a lot of Christian things things. We can do Catholic things. I in my life can do a lot of none things. But in the depths of my heart, if they were able to drop a, a drill down to the very core of my heart and pull it up, just take a specimen, would they find only Sister Regina Marie and Sister Regina Marie plans, Sister Regina Marie agenda? Or would they find that I belong to Jesus through and through and through to my very core? That was the question. What a beautiful question, and hard. And hard. And we went through a few exercises to, and described I, kind of like a, an examination of conscience mm -hmm. of different layers that can be in our hearts, uh, a restless heart that always wants to be doing something new and always looking for something change, uh, never quite satisfied with what we, we have, a little bit better job, a little bit more money, a little bit more something else we don't even sometimes know what it is, it's pushing us. But that's indicative of a restless heart. And a restless heart hasn't found Jesus yet. And a restless heart is not going to know joy. A restless heart's not going to know peace. So, so what's the remedy? You want to know the truth? If we really, indeed, and in truth, want Jesus, who is Jesus? First off, people frequently think of Jesus first and foremost as Redeemer. Well, he is absolutely that. He is the only Redeemer. But first and foremost, Jesus is not Redeemer. Because Redeemer came at a point in time. It came after Adam sinned. But from all eternity, with no beginning, Jesus was Son. He was the Son who was so in love with the Father he couldn't give enough to the Father. He received the Father completely and he gave himself. He's riveted on the Father's goodness and his beauty and his love. And he's consumed and he's absorbed and he's defined by that love. Well then if I'm going to be like Jesus, I need to have the Father's will my defining point. And where do we find the Father's will? Right in front of us. It's what is. Well, that was, talking to the people. That there wasn't there, 900 people in the, in the audience and I said, there's not one of you right now that's not carrying a burden or doesn't have a worry or a monkey on your back that you'd like to get rid of. It might be financial worries, it might be marital strain, a sick child, a superior that sends you to an assignment you don't want to go. And we have a tendency to think, well, if I could get through this or if I didn't have to deal with it, if I could get around it, then I could be free and be close to God. God's in the now. God is in what is. And tonight, if he decides to heal those people 
or tomorrow he decides to give them a resolution to their problem, then God is going to be in the healing then. But for right now, God's in the suffering. He's right there with them in it. And so we need to accept everything that's practical and concrete, our, our vocation. I was telling the people this morning that in the restaurant, somebody stopped me and said, Oh, mother, mother, I want to be a sister. I want to be a sister. <laughs> but you have six children. Go home and take care of your kids. <laughs> we, we get off on these things that are out here or over here, and what God has given us is right straight in front of us, and we stumble over it because it's so simple. Mm. I use the example of Brother Lawrence, who he was a Carmelite brother, lived four centuries ago, and he hated to cook. And so, as life usually has it, where did he get assigned? To the kitchen. <laughs> and you know what happened? He surrendered. In the ordinary surroundings of an ordinary kitchen, Brother Lawrence said, I'm not going to waste my time fighting. I'm going to waste my energy trying to have what I want. I'm going to use my energy seeking God because that's what I truly want. And in the midst of his pots and pans, this brother found God. And his, his work is a classic. It's beautiful. It's a little tight. He didn't set out to do anything. He, he wrote a few very simple letters. And when he would talk to uh, people that would come to talk to him, they would leave very inspired. And so they'd jot down these notes so they'd remember. And after his death, they compiled them. It's a little book called The Practice of the Presence of God. And four centuries later, he is still a source of encouragement and, and uh, instruction for people who want to live a contemplative life in their ordinary surroundings. Mm. And so that was the challenge that I held out to the people. In your surroundings, whether you're working in a studio or a hospital or a courtroom or a sick room, what is it that's keeping you from surrendering to God, from accepting totally what He provides for you, embracing the concrete here and now stuff that makes up our life. That's where God is found. It's very, very hard to remember, Sister. The Lord is right here. Right in the ordinary. Mm -hmm. It's very, very true. We, we have a, a an propensity to go out to big, complicated. But think of our Blessed Mother. What did she do while on earth? She took good care of Jesus. It's the only thing she did. She didn't take care of all the marriage problems in the town. She could have gone out and, you know, converted Herod, but that wasn't given to her. She took, she took good care of her little boy. Mm -hmm. And now she's mediatrix of all graces. She's queen of the cosmos. A little Palestinian girl. Nazareth. Mother, other than accepting the here and now, how else can we acquire an obedient heart? Ask for it. And it's not, it's not done once. That was, that was the other thing I told them. It, it's kind of like manna. Mm. It, it has to be fresh every day. <laughs> that we've all made a surrender to God. Everybody in that convention's room. Confirmed, dedicated to our Blessed Mother, marriage vows, religious vows. We've all made some kind of consecration. But that was really wonderful and powerful and true and sincere and real that day. But we have to renew it. And somebody came up to me afterwards and was crying. And she says, but I'm afraid to. And I said, then you make the offering to God with your fear. And you say that to them. You say, God, I'm afraid to offer myself to you because you're big. And you might take something I don't want to give you. But I want to give it, but I don't want to. We, 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 we do this all the time, you know, come, come close, God. Come, I want, we do it all, well, then be honest and tell him that. And he'll take you where you are. And you'll grow a little bit today, and you'll grow a little bit tomorrow. Fantastic. I hear you have a prayer. A prayer. I do. That you shared with people. Do you want to hear it? I want to hear it. Are you sure? This is what I told them. There's such a a motley group that had landed up in the same room at the same time, different language, different backgrounds, different vocations, different colors, different ages. But we all had this one common reason for being there. Everybody in that room 
is seeking Jesus. We all want to know him. And we're not satisfied with mere head knowledge. We want to know Jesus. We want to know his heart. We want to encounter the living God. And they all said, yes. Okay, but that's way too big for us. I'm just a, mo a mere mortal, mortal. That's way bigger than my reach. So then we turn in our need in prayer. So I asked them, I said, as I pray this, I want you to listen carefully. And do not say amen at the end of the prayer unless you mean it. If what I pray doesn't sit well with you, it's not what you want, then be silent. Be polite, but be silent. But if you do believe it, and maybe you're not perfect at it, that doesn't. He's the one that's perfect, not me. But if what the prayer says means what you want, then you say, Amen, and that's your signature. Shall we pray? Mm. In the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Mother Mary, your heart was obedient through and through. We ask you now to pray for us and to pray with us. Father, send your spirit on us, the spirit who will take our lukewarmness and turn up the burner to a consuming fire. We ask you in your mercy to disturb our mediocrity, undermine our complacency, we long to know your Son, and we long to be one with him. We ask you to pour out your love on us, a love that is so intense and so real that we desire to freely and willingly abandon our whole lives into your hands. We ask you this, Father, because you are our Father and we trust you. And we ask you this in the holy and life-giving name of Jesus, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Amen. A beautiful prayer, all-inclusive. How long have you been aware of this dimension of Jesus, the personal dimension, the personal one-to-one. -one. I cannot trace it back to any one experience or any one day. Oh, that's not true. I can't. I had an experience when I was 16 years old. I was not looking for Jesus. I, was, no, I wasn't 16. I was only 14. It was in April of my eighth grade. I was on retreat. And I was concerned, consumed with everything that a 14-year-old is consumed about. We were at a hoot and nanny. Remember this? This it tells, you, it tells everybody my age. Uh, it was back in the '60s, and we were sitting on the floor at our retreat house in Alhambra, California, and we were singing. We weren't even singing praise and worship songs. We were singing inspirational songs like "Blowing in the Wind" and "Where Have All the Flowers Gone?" And something poured over me. I had no, no disposition. I wasn't preparing for this. I wasn't seeking it but something poured over me from the top of my head all the way through, and I knew that I was known through and through, that every single thing about me was known and seen and loved, and that I needed to make a response. And it was all one whew. Yeah. And that was, I knew it was God. There was, there was never a question. It happened how many, 40 some years ago? Well, maybe 30 some years ago. Um, never doubted. Never have I doubted. It was, the, it was the Lord. But I've grown in intensity and I lose sight. I go to confession frequently because I, I get consumed with my daily routine and prayer, pressures and worries. And, but it's something that he's very faithful. And he keeps calling me, keeps calling, keeps reaching out for me. You're a nun and you still have to go to confession? confession. Oh, I go to confession all the time. Oh, yes. Yes, frequently. If I can, I get there every week. So you're not perfect after vows. 
Oh, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> no, you just get worse. <laughs> you see so clearly what the good... St. John of the Cross uses an analogy. And he said, right now, if you were to look at this room, it looks pretty clean. But if we were to pull those curtains back all the way and let the sun just pour in, all of a sudden you'd be able to see all these little flecks. And as the Holy Spirit continues to pour into your soul, you become so much more aware of all that you've been given and how irresponsible you've been in responding. How do you keep your spirituality alive and growing? Time before Jesus and the Blessed Sacrament. Oh. Yeah. And if, how often do you do that? Well, for religious, because that's my life. Mm -hmm. We rise early every morning before the hectic day gets off and we sit at his feet every day. Um, for, we'll, we make a half hour meditation, we chant in the morning office, we attend Mass. And then in the evening we make a holy hour together. And um, oh, I, I, I die. I, I, I can do without sleep, but do without prayer, I become a crazy woman about 30 minutes flat. I need my prayer. I just, I need to be there. Um, there's times for retreat. There's times for study. But it's the contact. It's a regular relationship. You need time with each other. With each other, you and Jesus. That's right. There's times when I start to get out of control during the day. It's like, oh, we need to talk. <laughs> yes. That's very interesting for our viewers who don't understand a prayer life of that depth. Could you share something about your prayer life or about prayer life in general? How to develop a better prayer life and why we should? I think you can take the, the same principles of an authentic friendship and apply it to Jesus. Mm -hmm. That in a, a real friendship, you need to be you. Uh, if you're being phony with the other person, the friendship's not gonna go any place. You need to spend time. You need to be able to let the person come to you on their, their terms. If, if I start judging the, oh, well, I know what he's gonna be like, you know, he's a, a rich pan or he's a, you'll never have a friendship. You have to allow the person to reveal to you who they are, not who you think they are. I think those would be the most, the most uh, important things, the honesty. C call out to God in honesty. And don't use words that you think are pretty. A great place to learn to pray are the Psalms. And I used to sit on my bed when I was a teenager and pray them out loud because there's angry Psalms. If you're in a bad mood, pray 44 or 77. They're crabby. Pray them. There's praise. There's, there's repentance. Um, there's crying out to God in need. They give you words, but eventually they, it needs to come from the depths of your own heart. Not that you ever outgrow the Psalms. That's a very good way to begin. Very good way. Inside, this friendship of Jesus does what for you? It, it defines me. It, it's my life. I, I don't... When, when he hides his face from me, whew, I, mm, no. It's, it's, I don't, I don't, I... So you spend time every day? Every day. Every day. And you find in that peace? Yes, sometimes it's not. Sometimes Jesus and I fight because he keeps wanting me to do something else and I don't want to do it. And, but eventually it resolves, eventually. And he's patient with me. He lets me fight with him. We have a darling little sister who's been in the convent for 75 years. And the talk that I gave yesterday was on the transitions of prayer. St. Teresa of Avila uses some, an analogy on drawing water Bringing, taking water to a garden, and there's different ways of doing it, and she um, compares that to different um, ways that we allow God's love to flow into our lives. And so we were talking one night at recreation, and this little sister, who's 75 years in the convent, is more alert than I will ever be on my best day. And she's completely faithful to our prayer life. We, we get up at 5 every morning, 5 to 5 every morning, and we start prayers at 5.20, and that little sister is in her place before I get there. Oh my gosh. She is. She's absolutely a gem. You would love her. 
but we were, she, the topic of this talk came up, and she says, oh, Mother, what are you going to speak about? And I said, transitions in prayer. And I looked at her, I thought, boy, she's an expert. For 75 years, she has spent a significant amount of time every single day, Christmas, Easter, ordinary days, celebration days. We are still before Jesus and the Blessed Sacrament. So I said, sister, what would you tell these people about transitions in prayer? And she chuckled and she went, well, I tell them it just happens. That's what it is. It's just like a sunrise. There's nothing I have to do to make that sunrise, but I need to allow myself to be in the presence of the sun, to absorb it. And that would be my recommendation to anyone who wants to grow in their prayer life. It doesn't have to be perfect. You might hit difficulties and frustrations, but don't quit. Don't withdraw. Stay there. Stay steady. And you will see he does the predominant work. We don't. We don't. We have, we have about two minutes more, and I'm wondering if you could share some of the transitions we talked about. Sure. No, that's fine. We begin by doing a lot of the work ourselves. And she uses the example of a bucket in the water. And that is analogous to vocal prayers said with love and attention, meditation, and uh, the prayer of acquired recollection. And all that means is a lot of words. Everybody knows how to meditate. Have you ever worried? Always. Oh, all right. Then you're an expert in meditation. That's just <laughs> negative meditation. You take a thought and you turn it over and you think about it over here and it's back here on the thought and you never, that's meditation. And you can do the same thing. You can learn with your own skills, your own power, to take the truths of the scriptures and hold those in meditation. And eventually, you can learn to collect. Recollect means collect, pull in your thoughts. Usually we're scattered, we're fragmented, we're all over the map. No, we can learn to pull in our thoughts and anchor them and rest with the truth that we've meditated on. If we will continue doing that, Jesus will come in and take that meditation while you're meditating, eventually. And there's no time uh, s schedule on it. He will come in and take that meditation and lift you further to the prayer of quiet. And prayer of, that, that transition is, I, I did some of the work. I showed up. I tried to meditate. You know, I read the gospel. But in that process, Jesus took me further than what I could do on my own power. And it's sometimes it's, at the beginning, it is so faint and such a gentle transition, we don't even know what's happened. And the same thing with uh, meditation, I mean, uh, recollection. I can pull my thoughts together. And yes, that's good, and I need to do that. But then eventually, Jesus gives me the power to stay anchored in the thoughts, in his awareness, in his presence, with much less effort on my part, and far more fruit than ever before. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, we move into a prayer of simple union. When all of me, prayer of simple union, all of me, my, uh, we have the power to think, the power to choose, the power to remember, the power to imagine, uh, use my imagination. And in the earlier forms of prayer, my will might be with Jesus. I want to be with Jesus. I'm desiring him, but my thoughts are all over the map. That's still all right. But in the prayer of union, everything, my memory, my imagination, my intellect, my thoughts, everything is anchored in Jesus. Mm -hmm. And it just continues in depth. It's not all these different stages as in the sense that they're different prayers. Mm -hmm. It's a growing intensity of an inflow of God. And he wants it for every single person. I told him, take your pulse. And if you have a, you can find one, and you're alive, you've been invited. You, you win the, you, you're holding the lucky winner ticket. Because that's why he created, that's the meaning of life, is communion with God. That's very powerful. Would you mind addressing the camera and speaking to the people watching this program? Invite them to experience what we have experienced. Our closeness to God has nothing to do with us. The spiritual life isn't about you and me. The spiritual life is about the Lord and about our union with Him. So we don't have to worry. If we haven't been perfect and we haven't been good, or we have or we have, that, that's irrelevant. He wants you. That's the reason why He created you. And if you will give Him half a chance, He will reveal to you the beauty of your soul 
and it's beyond what you and I can fathom. Beautiful soul destined for a beautiful life for all eternity with God. I'd cry out to him. I'd, I'd encourage you to cry out to him and trust him. He's never been known to let anyone down. We may not understand him, and there may, may be mysteries, but all things work together for the good of those who love him. Thank you so much, Mother. Very beautiful. My pleasure. It was wonderful to have you on our show. Thank you. Now you pray for me, that having preached, I be not lost. <laughs>I'm standing behind St. James's Church in Medjugorje. Inside, hundreds of pilgrims are getting ready to receive our Lord Jesus in the Eucharist. Now, you can receive the Lord Jesus at home right now just by inviting him into your heart and into your life. You can do that by just praying the short little prayer. So pray with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I invite you into my heart and into my life. I ask Lord to forgive me for every offense I've committed. Help me, Lord, by your grace to amend my life. Help me become holy as you are holy. And help me, Lord, to live the life that, that you call me to live. Help me to follow you. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, sincerely, Jesus is in your heart and is now a big part of your life. So, look forward to a whole new life in Jesus. Amen. Amen.